different flow uh, for us than a regular Sunday morning. If you're used to our Sunday mornings, this will be a little bit different tonight. We'll be receiving uh, communion as well in just a little bit. But tonight is a, a time that we are very much, we set aside and we just say, look, we are going to take a moment to slow everything down and to truly remember in some detail, it won't be too graphic, but in some detail of what Jesus did for us, the price, which was a high price, the price that he paid for us. So tonight, the message is called The Betrayal and Crucifixion. This is my wife, Tina. My name's Tim. We're the lead pastors here at Spirit Word Church, and uh, it's our honor to lead a service like tonight. Um, years ago, I began to do a study on the death of Jesus Christ, and I was blown away by the detail, by the things that, that are there, that are actually spoken in the Bible that so often we don't hear about, and you'll hear just some of those tonight. Honestly, you won't, you won't hear it all, but you'll hear some of the sacrifice that, that Jesus made for us. It was, it was worse than I think we all really know and that we can understand. The sacrifice goes much deeper than simply being nailed to the cross. I, I wish, I mean, that, that in itself is bad, but I, but I wish there wasn't more than that, but there, but there is. And so tonight, as we get started, we kind of pick up where we were last week, at the triumphal entry of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And at that moment, the issue was that the chief priests, the leaders of Israel, felt threatened. They were jealous of Jesus. He was gathering crowds, and they thought, he, he's going to cause the crowds to move away from us. He's going to cause problems to happen. We're going to lose this nation. And they simply decided the only way to get rid of Jesus was to kill him. And so tonight, like I said, we intentionally stop. And we remember all that he did, because it was a high price that he paid. It's, it's, you know, it's one thing to say that he gave his life. And, that, and that's, I mean, all, that's the ultimate price, right? I mean, when we give our life for a friend, the Bible says that's, that's the highest price. But to think all that he went through, that it wasn't quick. It wasn't quick at all. And as I said, so tonight, join us as we go through what would literally be the last hours of Jesus' life. So Jesus and the disciples are eating Passover meal together. And we're going to look at Matthew 26, 21 through 25. And it says, now as they were eating, he said, assuredly, I say to you, one of you will be betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it's written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said it. That's powerful right there. If you notice... The disciples called him Lord, except Judas. Judas called him rabbi. And see, there's a difference between Jesus being your rabbi, your teacher, and him being your Lord. So many people can know scripture and can quote scripture, and they can say that they believe in Jesus. But unless Christ has moves from being teacher to Lord in their life, their life's in danger just like Judas's. See, we need to go from the teaching position of believing in Jesus to the lordship position. See, we must learn to move from the lessons and the head knowledge, which so many have, to obedience and humility and a heart relationship with Jesus. So after this meal, Jesus leaves to gather, or Judas leaves to gather the mob that would arrest Jesus. And then Jesus shares in the first communion the Lord's Supper with his disciples. And then afterward, they gathered in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
Yeah, so imagine now it's, it's about midnight, and they're gathered in the garden. And along comes Judas with a crowd, a crowd of people. And they're carrying weapons, and they're carrying torches. It's a mob. Some of the translations call it a mob. Some call it a crowd. But it's a mob of people coming for Jesus. And in Matthew 26, at verse 47, it says, While he was still speaking, that's Jesus, Judas came, one of the, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now, I just, I just want you to know that um, some people have always thought that there were Roman soldiers that were in that crowd, but th- there weren't. If, if there were any soldiers at all, these would have been temple guards that were uh, Jewish. So these were only the Jews at this point that were coming after Jesus. Verse 48, Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. There it is again, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. They came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. It's amazing to be betrayed by a friend. Jesus called him friend. And Judas himself looked like all the other disciples. The other disciples didn't even know what was happening with Jesus, what was happening in his heart. They had, they had no idea. Judas was playing the game really well. He looked like one of the disciples. He looked like um, what you would expect them to look like. He blended in super, super well. And there are a lot of stories to learn from that. Because we can be religious, but not have a relationship with Jesus. We can call him rabbi, as Tina said, but not know him as Lord. And as she said, there is a big, big difference. You and I can sit in church, maybe even tonight, and look like a Christian. But according to what Jesus said, we could be a whitewashed tomb full of dead men's bones. That means you look good on the outside, but on the inside, there's just death. There's no life. You're, you're, li- you're living like, like two different people. And there are a lot of people in the church today that they've been coming and they're coming, but... They've never changed. Do you realize that that Judas spent three years with Jesus? Three years with Jesus himself. You would think anybody, that would change anybody. I mean, he saw the miracles. He heard the words. He heard the teachings. At one point, you understand that he was actually given power to heal the sick and cast out demons. Judas was. And yet he never knew Jesus the way he should know Jesus. He knew him only in a religious way. Judas was living that double life. Do you know that Judas, it says 30 pieces of silver. That sounds like a lot of money, doesn't it? 30 pieces of silver, you know, that's, that's kind of tempting. The equivalent today would have been $280. Silver sounds like a lot to you and I, but these are little coins. These weren't worth a whole lot. And there's a whole other story behind that that someday we'll get to. But $280, maybe 300 tops, is what he would give, he would betray Jesus for. It's it's a crazy thing. So let me just say this. The betrayal of somebody close to you is always possible. If I said, who's been betrayed in this room, I guarantee you at least half the room would stick their hand up. We've all probably been betrayed in some way by somebody else. We thought we could trust them. We thought that we loved them. And what's what's amazing is that we're always betrayed by friends. Enemies don't betray you. You never trusted them anyway. It's always by the people that you love. It's by the people you look up to. It could be a mentor. It could be a teacher. It could be a parent. It could be your best friend. And, and, And they say one thing, but then something happens and it goes the other way and you feel betrayed. Maybe not as extreme as this. This was pretty extreme. And just understand that from the very beginning... Jesus chose Judas, and he knew this from the very beginning, that he would be betrayed. But here's the cool thing, sort of. Without betrayal, we wouldn't have salvation. And so I want to say this to you. 
Maybe you've been betrayed tonight. Maybe, you know, not, maybe not tonight. Maybe tonight. I don't know. But maybe you've been betrayed and you sit here and you think, man, I'm never going to trust anybody again. I'm, I'm, done with, I'm done with everything. I, I don't want to trust people. I can't trust people. I've put the walls up. And I, I just want to remind you that God says that all things work together for good to those who love him. Now, it is to those that love him. And if you don't love him, there's no guarantee of that. But if you love him, even though you've been betrayed, God can turn the whole thing around. And he can use it. He is aware of even the betrayal that has happened in your life. And even if it happened years ago, even if you were the one that betrayed somebody else, you can simply ask for forgiveness and God will begin to restore everything because he is a God of restoration. And we can trust him. And he will redeem. I can tell you, he will redeem every wrong thing that you have done or everything that has been wronged, like been done to you. He can redeem it all. He can bring it all back to life. So we see here that they bind Jesus' hands and take him to the high priest. It's here that they agree that they have legal reason to kill Jesus because he makes himself equal with God. So let's read Matthew 26, 63 through 66. It says, But Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us who, if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. So all this was taking place. And Peter, one of his disciples, was following at a distance. And he sat down at a courtyard by the fire. And we see here where Peter was approached three times by people that said, you're one of those disciples. You were the one of those that was with Jesus. And Peter denies Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times in that moment. And on the third time, when he denies Jesus, Peter hears the rooster crow. And the Bible says, at that moment, Jesus turned and looked at Jesus. I can't even imagine what they both were feeling in that moment. Because they both loved each other so much. See, Jesus, again, is betrayed. But this time, it's by one of his closest friends, one he loves. It's one thing when a stranger betrays us and wrongs us, but when it's a close friend, it's all the more pain that we feel. And all of us have felt the sting of a friend betraying us, and it hurts. But before even this had happened, Jesus had told Peter, he said, when the Lord turned and looked at him, Peter remembered this. And Peter, said, or Peter remembered the words that Jesus said. He said, before the rooster crows, you will de deny me three times. And so Peter, he just went out and bitterly wept. Because he knew he messed up. He knew. He was so devastated. I, I just can't even imagine. Because he, he said, Jesus, no, when Jesus told him that, no, I will go to the death with you. And then he turns around, and what does he do? He denies the very one that he loved three times. He gave in to the pressure, haven't we all? And he runs out of the courtyard. See, Jesus knew Peter would deny him. And he knew Satan would opportune in that moment. But Jesus prayed that Peter's faith would not fail. I love that. He's like, Peter, may your faith not fail. Because he knew Peter had a heart of love after him. See, Jesus looks at our heart. Even though we mess up, Jesus looks at our heart that truly loves him and says, may your faith not 
fail. I will forgive you. Repent and get up and turn and move forward. As the story goes on, the Jews are holding Jesus, and his very own people are blinded to who Jesus is, and now they are blindfolding Jesus, punching him, slapping him, and they even spit on him while saying, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one that just hit you? I mean, the audacity of what they were doing. But Jesus, like a lamb, he was willingly being led to the slaughter for you and me. So it's now in the morning, and they bring Jesus to Pilate. He's the governor. He's the Roman governor of that area. And they bring in the Pilate, and uh, Pilate finds no fault in him, none whatsoever. He knows. He knows that the Jews actually have done a frame up, that they're just jealous of the crowds that Jesus has gathering around him. And he knows this is not a good situation. Multiple times, multiple times, Pilate tried to release Jesus. And he finally offers Barabbas. Barabbas is a lot like you and I. Barabbas was a thief. Barabbas was a murderer. He started an insurrection, or he was at least part of the insurrection. In many ways, Barabbas was a bad dude. And it's interesting, so here you have this guy, Barabbas, and he's full of sin. And Jesus becomes the one who replaces even Barabbas. Showing us that even in the darkest of our sins, Jesus died for us. Jesus came that we could be set free just as Barabbas was set free on that day. He's a, he's a symbol of you and I that the worst of sinners can be set free. And so the crowds, though, they, they say, he's trying to offer them Barabbas. He's trying to say, look, I'll, I'll release a person for you. Uh, would you. Would you rather have Barabbas released or would you rather have Jesus released? And I, I personally think this isn't completely clear in the Bible, but I personally think that Pilate chose Barabbas because it was such a clear distinction. I think he thought in his heart, surely they will not pick Barabbas. This guy's, this guy's rough. This guy's bad. But they all say Jesus, and they begin to yell, crucify him, crucify him. They want Jesus crucified. They want Barabbas released. And out of fear of Pilate's position as governor, because if, if chaos starts to happen, he's, he's going to be out of control and he's, or everything's going to be out of control and he's going to lose his job, to be quite honest. So out of fear of a riot about to happen, he decides to go ahead and listen to what they're saying. And he has Jesus scourged and crucified. Matthew 27, verse 27 then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. And they gathered the whole battalion before them. A battalion is about 600 men. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his, put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Now, if you would just slow down and, and say, you know, maybe you've read this enough times that you're a little bit callous to it. But this is an all out demonic attack on Jesus himself. Because you can see the taunting. It's not just we're going to whip him and then he deserves to be on the cross. There's a taunting, there's, a, there's a, um, such a, a making fun of him, a deliberate action on their part to make him feel small and ridiculous. 600 men, kind of like when you get that much testosterone in a room, there's a lot of joking, there's a lot of bad humor going on, and I think all of that was happening. And I think this was a horrible, horrible scene. Imagine they're, they're kneeling down and calling him king and 
and and they they would actually one of one of the uh, uh, one of the translation it, it comes off that they were actually saluting him, completely making fun of him, putting that reed in his hand. They take the reed out of his hand, and now they're hitting him on top of the head with that crown of thorns. Those thorns will get you. I mean, they are they are long, they are stiff, they are sharp, and they hurt. And it's on his brow, it's on his forehead, being hit with a reed. <laughs> I think it's bad enough to be hit on top of the head with a reed, much less a crown of thorns on top of it as well. The Bible says they pulled out his beard. They were cruel to him. They beat him terribly. Isaiah 52, 14 says this. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. I can only imagine what he must have looked like. And they brought him out. I think the crowd must have just gasped. I personally, I, I mean, I don't know. There's no biblical way to say this, but, but I think they did more harm to Jesus than what they normally do to those being crucified. He was disfigured. He was swollen. He was black and blue. He was bloody. Bloody in the mouth. Bloody in the nose. It's, it's a horrible, horrible scene. They nail him to the cross. And he hung there in agony. And it's absolutely amazing to think. You see this man hanging on the cross completely helpless at this point. 100% helpless. And yet they still come along and they're actually throwing insults at him still. They're still making fun of him. And these are some of the people that weren't even in there with the Roman guards. In Mark 15, 29, it says, Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him. The leaders, the priests, were mocking him as he hung there on the cross. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now. Come from the cross that we may see and believe. So while on the cross, Jesus said in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See, we get offended to the core when a friend or a relative has betrayed us. Instead of forgiveness, our response is often like anger, revenge, or we just want to cut the person off. We've all done this. Yet Jesus was betrayed, mocked, humiliated verbally, emotionally, and physically, and he still willingly gave his life for all of humanity, for all of us who fail him so often. He died for you and for me. What great love is that? That is amazing grace, amazing love. See, Jesus carried our sin, the sin of every person, past, present, and future, and still asked the Father to forgive them. He has to forgive you and me through the generations. That's our Jesus. That's our Savior. The one that's full of love, that's full of forgiveness, who gave his life willingly, paid the price willingly so we could be free. The love of Jesus is deeper and wider than any ocean. And he says that he throws our sins as far as the east is from the west. Thank you, Jesus. In the end, Jesus cried out, it is finished. In the Greek, the word is tetelestai. Tetelestai, let's say that better. That means nothing else to do. Nothing left to pay. Jesus paid it all, totally, completely, permanently. And this means when you give your heart to Jesus, your debt of sin is fully paid. It means the sentence for punishment and judgment of what we deserve has been served by Jesus. And it means the battle against devil and the sin has been won. He won it all. 
He won it all for you and me. It is finished. Then Jesus died on that cross. Matthew 27, 51 through 54 says, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from the top to the bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Wow, wouldn't that be wild? When the centurion and those who were with him kept wa keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Incredible. Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. As we just described, Jesus went to the cross. He paid our penalty. I always describe it, try to bring this down in really simple terms. But when you get arrested, if you were ever to get arrested, even pulled over for a traffic violation, small or big, there's a fine that's going to have to be paid. And... In the spiritual realm, there is a fine that has to be paid because you and I broke the law. Every single person in this room, in this world, is a sinner. The Jesus is the only one who has never sinned. Everyone else has sinned. What that means is you're guilty of breaking the law. You're guilty of breaking God's law. And there is a penalty, there's a fee that must be paid. And the fee... The penalty for breaking God's law, any law, is death. You didn't live the perfect life, and so you deserve death. And what's incredible is that though you owe that penalty now, you owe that fee, you and I deserve to die, God actually sent his own son, Jesus, and said, hold on a second. I want to pay their penalty. I want to pay their fee. That's a high price to pay. As we said in the very beginning. To have someone come and pay the fee of death for you is a high, high price. He willingly laid down his life. One of the things that I like to say is that though the Bible is very, very clear that he was murdered. Jesus knew it the whole time, and he was actually laying his life down, allowing them to do it because this is why he was born in the first place. He was born to die. He was born to sacrifice his life. He was born to give his life for you and I so that he could redeem us. That means to buy back. He redeemed us through the blood of Jesus. The Bible says that only blood can forgive sins. That's in Hebrews. Only blood can forgive sins. So Jesus hung on that cross. He was beaten so badly, bruised and, and bleeding everywhere. And he hung on that cross with his blood being poured out so that you and I could have our sins washed away. Your sins are not forgiven because you've lived a good life. Your sins are not forgiven because... You've been coming to church now for a whole year. Your sins are not forgiven because your parents go to church and you were raised in church. None of that forgives your sins. All of that's good. All of that's healthy, good stuff. But it doesn't remove the sins. The only thing that removes our sins is the blood of Jesus Christ. But you have to believe that by faith. You have to humble your own heart. And say, I'm a sinner. You have to make that decision yourself. Because the other, the other alternative is to be like Judas. And that's to be around Jesus. That's to come to church. That's to see miracles, signs, and wonders happening right before you. Hear the teaching and yet never change. You just 
think that you're a Christian because you go to church or because you read the Bible. You know, you can read the Bible every single day and still go to hell. Because you don't allow it to change you. You won't humble your heart and see that it's talking about you. It's talking about me. Sin must be forgiven. And then what we have to do, which, which Judas was unwilling to do, is we not only call Jesus our Savior, but he becomes our Lord as well. What Lord means is that I am deciding that my whole life is going to die every day just as Jesus gave up his life. I'm going to die to myself. and I'm going to live my life according to the word of God, according to what Jesus speaks to me, according to the Holy Spirit in my life. I'm going to live according to his way and not my way. And you can't have it both ways. Your, your way and my way is like, it's just always wrong. We make some of the dumbest choices. And we think some of the craziest things. But when we follow after God, you're not giving up something. You're gaining everything. You're gaining everything. And the only way to understand what I'm kind of saying tonight is that you've got to become humble in your own heart. You've got to say, man, I, I have blown it. I am a, sa- I am a, I am a sinner. And I'm a mess. And the truth of the matter is, that's all of us. And if we do not have a Savior, if we do not have one that went to the cross, that shed his blood for us, that rose from the dead, if we do not have that person in our life, then your sins are not forgiven because you have not received him by faith. And so it's more than just intellectual understanding. I could write down that, that Jesus must be your Lord and your Savior. You must believe that he died on the cross. You must believe that his blood washes your sins away. You must believe that he rose from the dead three days later. And, and you've got to believe these things. And if you do, then you'll go to heaven. But it's more than that. It has to come from understanding it and hearing it with your regular ears to hearing it with spiritual ears. And it suddenly sinks down into the heart. And that's where it makes the difference. That's where everything is changed. That's where salvation comes from. And so it isn't even just by saying a prayer. And that confuses a lot of people sometimes. Because some people probably in this room, maybe you raised your hand one time in church and you said a prayer and and you were kind of in that moment, but nothing in your life really changed. And you're wondering, why did nothing change? Maybe you actually came forward at an altar call. You know, they call them altar calls and people come forward sometimes and and they say yes to Jesus. But Nothing in your life changed. Most of the time, the reason that that happens is because you didn't get saved. It wasn't just coming forward that doesn't save you. It's a heart condition. It's always the heart condition. Do I believe that I'm a sinner? Do I believe that the only way for my sins to be forgiven is through the blood of Jesus Christ? Do I really believe that? And if you can admit tonight to yourself and to God that you're a sinner, And that you need a Savior. And if you can admit that that Savior is Jesus Christ, then there is no other name. There is no other person that can save you but the name, the person of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. If you can honestly say that and believe that, the Bible says that you can be born again and that you can live eternally in heaven. Eternal life is simply this. It's not that we live physically in these Bodies, because one day you're going to get a new body, and that's another thing we'll talk about in a few days. So that's, that's another story. So it isn't a physical death, like you're never going to die. The truth is, we're all going to die. It's a 100% guarantee that all of us are going to die at some point, unless Jesus comes back. And we have to decide, right here, right now, Not when he comes back, because it'll be too late. We have to decide right here, right now, do I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior? Do I believe that he died on the cross for me? Do I believe that he's the only hope that I have? Because again, your good works aren't going to do it. And if good works did it, then the Bible says that you and I could actually say, look at what I've done. 
I'm amazing. I saved myself. Then can I ask you, why did Jesus go to the cross? If you can save yourself, if I can save myself, why did Jesus go to the cross? John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever, whoever, that whoever, that whoever, that whoever believes shall, uh, in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever believes. So let me just say this to you. It doesn't matter what you've done or not done. It doesn't matter how bad you have been. There was a criminal hanging on the cross right next to Jesus. And that criminal humbled his heart. And he was saved while he was hanging on the cross. But I want to tell you something. Don't try that. Don't try and say, well, I'll do that at the last minute. Because it's exactly right, whoever said that. You don't know when your last minute is. There is no guarantee of tomorrow. And so you need to decide. Am I going to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Am I going to accept that his blood washes my sins away? Or am I going to try to live life on my own, handling everything on my own? And somehow you're going to achieve eternal life through that. It is only through the blood of Jesus. There is no other way. So I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes tonight. And with nobody looking around, I have a couple of things that I want to ask you. Have you ever given your heart to Jesus Christ? Have you ever asked him, like through humility, asked him to be your Lord and Savior? Have you ever admitted to him that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior, that his blood washes your sins away and there's no other way for those sins to be washed away? Have you ever come to that place? And then others of you, I mentioned this earlier, but some of you may actually say, man, I, I did that, but like nothing ever changed in my life. I, I'm still sinning the same way. I still have the same thoughts. It's just, there's nothing has changed. Then I would tell you tonight to humble your heart. Your heart, not your head. This is more than understanding. Humble your heart. And ask him to wash your sins away. Believe that the blood of Jesus is the only thing that can wash those away. And some of you may, may be out here tonight and you're like, man, I, I just, I don't know. I'm not really sure. I mean, I feel like I've, I've done it, but I'm not really sure. And you're just kind of, maybe you just don't know. You've been in church for a while and you just, I just don't know where I stand. If really, if I get honest with God, if I'm just really, really honest, I, I really just don't know. So maybe you've never given your heart to Jesus before. Maybe you've raised your hand, you've come forward and something never changed. Or maybe you're just like, I, I don't know. And any of those occasions, I want to ask you right now with nobody looking around. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to say a prayer together. Like everybody in the room together. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and just say, yeah, that's me. Because you need to make a move tonight that says, that's me. I'm, I'm the one that Jesus is talking to tonight. I'm the one that needs to receive uh, salvation tonight. And so I'm going to ask you all over this place, with nobody looking around, if you would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you would like to admit that you're a sinner and that you need him to wash your sins away, would you just raise your hand up real high so I can see it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. Now go ahead and put your hand back down. I want to ask again, don't, if you've already raised your hand, you don't need to raise it up again. I just want to give you one more opportunity. You saw how many hands went up. And this is what I always tell people. If you're sitting there, you got your head bowed just like you are right now, and your heart is beating, and you're thinking, I really should do this. And you want to put your hand up, but you're afraid to. Can I just tell you, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. Jesus himself, through the Spirit, is speaking to you. He's drawing you. He's saying, listen, I'm talking to you. You're the one. Give up. Let me have control of your life. Let me wash your sins away. That's a humility thing. That's a hu that you just got to humble your heart. So again, if you've already raised your hand, don't raise it up. But if you're like, yes. I'm, I'm going to say yes tonight. Then raise your hand up real high. 
you haven't done it yet, raise your hand up. Come on, buddy. I see your hand. A couple of kids here. Praise God. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. I don't even know how many people that was, but that was a bunch. And what a great time to come to know Jesus. What a great time. We're going to say a prayer. You can look at me if you're not yet. We're going to say a prayer together. And I'm going to ask everybody in the room to say it together with us. And when we do, there's just something that you have to do. You just have to mean it from your heart. You're not just saying words. The words don't save you. This is a prayer. You're actually talking to Jesus himself. He is yet alive, believe me. He was dead, but three days later, he rose from the dead. And he is alive, and he hears you, and he's drawing you tonight. And so what I want you to do is I want you to speak to him. Talk to him. As we're talking, as we're praying, speak to him and allow him to change you. Allow him to wash your sins away. All right, let's bow our head, close your eyes again. Say this prayer with me. Just say, Father God, I thank you for sending Jesus. And Jesus, tonight, I thank you for dying on the cross. I thank you that your blood was shed. And tonight I admit that I'm a sinner. And I need my sins washed away. I believe that your blood washes my sins away. And so I ask you to forgive me. Change me forever. And right now, I receive your forgiveness. Come into my life. Change me forever. I'm deciding tonight also to follow after you. I am calling you Lord tonight for the first time or however many times you've done. I'm calling you Lord tonight. So be my Lord. And be my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now listen, man. That's incredible. Now here's what's amazing. According to the Bible, if you meant that in your heart, you are now born again. And what that means is that the Spirit, the Spirit of God was actually blown into you as you said that prayer, as you meant that prayer, and your spirit went, whoo, what, whoo, it just came alive. That is exactly, truthfully, what happened. Your spirit came alive, and you are now what they call, what the Bible calls, born again. Born again, when that spirit comes alive, because before this, your spirit was dead. And so congratulations, I mean, that's a whole bunch of people, and there were a whole bunch of kids, and I I believe God is doing something with our children. They're responding to his call at a young age, And, and even... Even you who are older, there's, there's no age limit. So praise God, I'm, I'm just excited. That was a lot of people. Um, there's a couple of things that we need to tell you. And, and one is, that's the greatest decision you'll ever make in all of this life. And when you head out of here today, we're not, we're not finished yet, but when you head out today, there's going to be a book that's at the Welcome Center. And I, I just encourage you to pick it up on the way out. If you gave your heart to Jesus, I hope we have enough books. I think we do. We do. Um, uh, (laughs) pick one up on your way out. It's going to help you to understand this decision. It's going to help you to go deeper in the Lord. And we also have a class that meets here every Monday night at seven o'clock. This class is for every person, especially it's for any, especially for any new believer. And there's a whole bunch of new believers in here tonight. Even if you've been in the church for a long time, but you're just now really coming to Jesus, I would encourage you to take this class. It's so important. We've had testimonies come in about how, the, how uh, the, ca- the class has caused them to grow so quickly. And I've seen people. I've literally, you can see people when they grow. Uh, when your spirit becomes alive, it's like the Bible. Now, when you go to read the Bible, it's actually going to start making sense. It's an incredible thing that happens. Like, all of a sudden, your ears have opened. Your eyes have opened. And, and you're on this amazing, amazing ride now with Jesus. So congratulations, on that. Be sure to pick those things up. Be sure 
uh, to get that on your way out. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to have Pastor Steve come up because this is an incredible time for us all to receive communion together. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Can we just celebrate one more time all the people who just gave their life to Jesus? You know, they say that the angels in heaven celebrate if one does. Could you imagine the party going on right now? Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Well, like Pastor said, we're going we're gonna to partake in communion right now. Uh, they gave a great explanation of the reason why. And the reason we are doing this tonight is to honor Jesus for what he did for us, okay? So let's go to 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, gave thanks to God for it. He broke the bread into pieces and said, This is my body, which is given up for you. This in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed by my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread or drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The elements are going to be right up here. We'll talk about them here in just a minute. The bread, there's going to be a top that has the bread, and the other side's going to have uh, the drunk, with the, the drink that represents the drink, that juice. Thank you. Thank you. That represents his blood, okay? The, the cracker in there represents his body, which has been broken for you, okay? The juice represents the blood that he shed for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, because a sin cannot be forgiven without the shed of blood. Amen? So that's the purpose of that. So what we're going to have you do is we're going to have you uh, come up here and take an element, take it back to your chair and sit and we'll all partake it together. Okay? Now the body that we're going to be taking, the, the cracker we take, it's for his broken body, but it, it's for the healing, not only physically, but spiritually of us. Like Pastor was just talking, you gave your life to Jesus just now. You had a spiritual awakening, a spiritual healing. Hallelujah. So that's what that's for. So what we're going to do is we're going to have everybody come up here. We'll grab an element, and then we'll go and sit down, and then we'll wait until everybody gets it. We'll take it together. So you can go ahead and start taking it.
we all ready? Let's just pray real quick. Father God, we come before you and honor you for the sacrifice you made on this day for us. For everything that you had to go through, Lord, we remember today and honor you in communion with you. And we thank you in your holy name. All right, so let's open up the top of the crack. This is the body of Christ that was broken for you. Go ahead and take your drink. We'll go ahead and open up the juice. This represents the blood of Jesus that was shed for each and every one of you. Go ahead and drink. Now there are cups that are on your left hand side. If you wouldn't pick those up and just pass them to your right, you can drop your empties into those and the ushers will grab them from you. We'll close this with prayer. Father God, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you for everything that you did for us, Lord. For all the stuff that you went through on this day for us. The pain, the agony, the shedding, the, all the stuff that you had to do, Lord. You did it with us in your mind. We thank you so much for everything that you do for us. We thank you for doing this for us this day. And we love you with all our hearts. In your holy name we pray. Amen.